It's the weekend and you have financial questions that need answering. That can only mean one thing. It's time for Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome, welcome. It's Jill on Money, and it is an exciting and momentous day for us here. It is the 500th show here at the Jill on Money radio show. I cannot believe it. To mark the occasion, let me start by saying, number one, we're broadcasting from the Capital One Bank Virtual Studios. Capital One, this is banking reimagined. What's in your wallet? Number two, oh my gosh, do I have something very special for you. We have, I think for maybe only the second or third time ever in the past 100 years or 500 shows, executive producer, Mark Telercio. Welcome to the show, Mark. How are you? Can I ask you a question? Who was our studio sponsor 10 years ago? Did we have one? Um, 10 years ago, we did not have any sponsors. And, um, and you know, what can I say? We've come a long way. Mark, how are you feeling about 500 shows that you have now produced for us? Yeah, it's, uh, it's crazy when you think about it. 10 years, a lot has changed. That's for sure. I think when we started, I was working overnights, right? Back in radio, I think. With radio? Yeah, radio, then TV. And then you were in London and I was in London. And now here I am we're looking at a, a 15-month-old baby. So a lot has changed in 10 years. So Mark, you want to tell everyone how we actually met? Do you remember how we met? I don't remember how. I mean, I know we met in the radio newsroom. I was working at radio and then you were hired shortly thereafter as a uh, a business analyst. That's how we met. Let's do a little quick reminder of like, what is the origin story of Mark Telercio? You graduated college, you had been working in media, then what'd you do? Yeah, I graduated from Arizona State, spent seven years there working in local market of Phoenix. And then I got hired at the network in 2005. And that's when I moved back to New York, which was good because, you know, that's where I'm originally from. So it was good to come home. And from 2005 until when did you work in radio? Till 2011. And in 2011, I went over to network television at CBS. And then in 2015, I exited CBS for good and basically worked for you or with you full time. I like that you made that with you because, you know, I don't ever feel like that you work for me. I feel like I work for you. I serve you because you basically tell me what to do all the time. I remember meeting you in the newsroom because you, um, you and I would talk after there was be a financial story. And I remember that in 2009, which was my first year at CBS, was sort of the end of the financial crisis, middle of the recession. At the end of 2009, the head of CBS Radio News asked me to do a year-end special. And so he said, who do you want to produce it for you? And I said, how about that kid, Mark? He seems smart. And that's the first time we really worked together. And it was a fantastic special, I might add. We actually interviewed a lot of really cool people. It was uh, you and the late, great Dave Barrett. Oh, right. Dave Barrett, our old friend who passed away. Oh my gosh, it's too much. So a little throwback, I guess, is that um, we have an interview with uh, our boss at that time, Harvey Nagler. He was the vice president of CBS Radio News. He had a storied career at CBS. And when did he retire? A few years ago? Two, three years ago? I I think 2017. So 2017, he, he left. So you got a chance to interview your old boss. How was that? It's like riding a bicycle. It's kind of like uh, no time had passed at all. It's just sitting in his office like I used to and shooting the breeze with him. So yeah, we I chatted with him last week and kind of just asked him about his uh, you know his memories from that time period ten years ago. What went into the decision making process? If he had any hesitation at all? And of course, you know, he just went on to kiss your butt for about four or five minutes. And as he should, because I kissed his butt for as long as he was at the network division as well as post network, even in retirement. So uh, here is Mark's interview with Harvey Nagler, storied radio icon. The first show aired in January of 2011. So I imagine these conversations with you started probably in late 2010. Do you have have any recollection of what those early conversations were like and how she kind of approached you about this whole thing? I was struck by her uh, extraordinary knowledge of finance. And um, her ability to speak in terms that, that I thought listeners would understand. Um, you know, this is a really, really valuable ability because usually what you've got are people who understand either 
the finance aspect of things or they're good talkers or they're good news people. But it's very rare that you have the ability to combine both the expertise and the ability to talk in terms of, that your listeners are going to understand. And that was really what struck me when I first met Joe. So this time in 2010, your title was what? I was vice president of news at um, CBS uh, in charge of our um, about 600 affiliates, 33 million listeners who listen to CBS News uh, each week. So you were, safe to say, the, the ultimate decision maker. I mean, did you have any reluctancy? Were you hesitant? What, what made you finally kind of like, you know, give the green light and let us uh, produce quite a few demos for you from what I remember? Well, at first, um, Jill started to work uh, for us at uh, CBS News as uh, an analyst, basically, a commentator on uh, news and finance events. And uh, she excelled at doing that. She did that for uh, a period of time um, before she uh, walked into the office and said, you know, Harv, I, I, I want to do a talk show. What do you think? As her listeners may know, uh, she had already had some experience working up in New England uh, doing a talk show for many years. So uh, it was a natural uh, for me to suggest to her that it sounded like a great idea and she should go for it. Wow, you were that easy, huh? You know, you know immediately in our business when somebody connects with the audience and knows what they're talking about. These abilities are very, very rare to be so knowledgeable about a particular subject. And yet, particularly in finance and financial planning, to talk in terms that the average listener is going to understand. And so when you meet somebody who is able to combine those abilities, uh, you know instantly that this is going to be a home run and, and this is going to work out. Ten years later, I mean, you know the radio landscape. It's very rare that anything lasts 10 years. Are you, are, what do you think the fact that here we are 10 years later and it's still going? Jill is so good at what she does and is so strong in getting the message out of what's important. It hasn't surprised me at all that uh, 10 years later, she's still doing this and is, is strong and is better than ever. So any final well wishes, words of encouragement as she, uh, as she looks to open the book on maybe the next 10 years? I would just encourage her to keep doing uh, what she's doing, to continue to get her message out on as many platforms as she possibly can to influence listeners, because at the end of the day, our community of listeners uh, and viewers are the ones who are going to be uh, most affected by her words of wisdom, her pearls of wisdom. And uh, I only encourage her to keep doing it because she's been doing a great job these past 10 years and hope for many years to come. Okay, so that was Mark's interview with Harvey Nagler, the former vice president of CBS Radio News. When we come back, Mark gets to talk to our current boss. We always consider him our boss, Craig Swagler. He is the vice president and general manager of CBS News Radio, although he has a new title also, the vice president and general manager of CBS Audio Network. During the break, go to our website, jillonmoney.com, and sign up for our free weekly newsletter. Okay, 500th show. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger takes the mystery out of your finances. You're back. It's Jill on Money. This is the program that takes the mystery out of your financial life for, you ready for this? 500 shows. And you know, we don't do dailies. This is weekly. So this is a decades of work, a more than decade. When did we actually start the show? For that, I must go to my executive producer extraordinaire, third time on the microphone. I think only the third time, Mark, is this show, because I remember you did it once. What was the other time we did it for? For the CFP? Yeah. Right, when, when you announced to our fans that I had pursued my CFP uh, designation and, and passed. Act, and passed, exactly. So Mark Telercio, executive producer extraordinaire. So all the things that Mark does in my life, 
In addition to this radio show, he produces, also produces our podcast, our sister podcast that is called Jill on Money as well. Mark also does the whole website. Mark also does all the social media stuff that we do. He creates the weekly newsletter. He kind of manages my life. So it's fabulous, frankly, to have a mark. Everyone should have a mark in their lives. Do you think, Mark, that (laughs) how would you characterize our relationship when you think about it? Is it more of like a sibling, a aunt, you know, because I am so much older than you are. You're not that much older. Um, No, I think more of a sibling, really. Yeah. I never approaches anything like like a job you know it's uh you know when we started this thing 10 years ago it was always a part-time thing for us and our, i think our, our goal and our dream was always one day for it to be full-time and when that happened it was just the best thing that ever happened to me in my professional life by far wow i mean and i didn't even prompt you to say that of course it's not my only thing that i do although i would like it to be the only thing that i do you know, you got your CFP. So you you learned that you were more into this than you thought, right? So when did that start creeping in that you thought about a CFP? When when did you say like, hey, I could get that? I think 2015 is when I started toying around with it in my head, but I never really acted on it until January of 2017 is when I started taking the courses. What, did you think you wanted to actually go into financial planning? Um, no, and I, I don't know. I, that's something I still think about, but as you know, I'm kind of used to just <laughs> working, working the way we work now. So I don't know that I can ever go back into a traditional office setting, which I'm guessing that would probably require. So uh, no, I never really had that thought. It was more personal knowledge. I was always th- concerned, not concerned, but I always like sort of in the back of my head said, ah, oh, he's never going to want to do this full time because he's a news junkie. And you really are, you were and have been a news junkie for your whole life. So how hard was it not to be in the news cycle, especially when things no. big started to occur? The, that's not hard at all. You know, when I talked to Harvey, I asked Harvey if he missed it at all. And he said, not for one second. And I feel the exact same way. There's not one thing I miss about working in a newsroom, not one. Except those great people. Okay, I'm just kidding. It's, it's some of them. Maybe the free lunches when there was breaking news. Other than that, when, I, when I'm home and there's a major breaking story going on and I say to myself, oh, gee, do I wish I was in a newsroom for this? Not, not for one second do I ever think that. How do you describe the difference between working in the radio division and the television? Because you worked at, at the television network at CBS News and the TV side for our friend Bill Felling. And so what was the difference between the radio and TV world? Radio is probably easier to pull off. There's a lot of moving parts in television. You know, radio, you can just stick a microphone. Nowadays, you don't even need a microphone. You can do something on your phone. But in television, you know, you got to have the camera crew, multiple cameras, the, the, the sound technician, the satellite trucks. It's just a lot more involved. Do you think it's harder to tell a good story on radio because you don't have the visual aspect? Yeah, I would. I, I don't know if it's harder. It's definitely different. It's a different challenge. Yeah, you got to really have to paint the picture and and try to use a lot of uh, you know natural sound and sound bites, etc. All right. So, what is the most important thing? Uh, let's say three things that you have learned from being self-employed. Now, let's let kind of connect the dots. You're now self-employed, essentially, versus being an employee. What's the the upside and the downside? Uh, there's no downside. The upside is um, one, you got to surround yourself with good people. Now, I only surround myself with one person, but you're the best. So you have to surround yourself with good people. That I can't even believe you're saying this out loud. You've never said such nice things to me. I'm putting you on the microphone every week. Two, there's no price tag on flexibility. That's just, it's a huge, huge thing, especially now being a parent. It's its huge. I don't know if there's a third one that comes to mind. Those are the two two most important things for me, surrounding yourself with good people and flexibility. I love that. You've learned my way. All right. Now let's go into our interview. You interviewed Craig Swagler. He's the vice president and general manager of the CBS Audio Network, CBS News Radio. So it was Harvey, then Constance for like a few minutes, and then Craig came in after. And so Mark's interview with Craig Swagler that's coming up right now. There's been this transition. You're kind of, you know, you're running the show now. You're calling the shots. So what made you stick with Jill and stick with the show and keep it running? Jill is one of the most transformative and compelling individuals when it comes to business and economic news. She breaks things down so understandably into realistic 
digestible topics and they're so relatable that without a question, Jill's ability to do that in a continual turbulent time of our uh, financial concerns people have is crucial, not only to the makeup of all the shows we have, but to informing our audience of the best pieces of information that drive a lot of their decisions that affect their homes and their families. And it was it was without a question that what Jill was doing uh, was important to the work we were doing overall, not to mention the slew of honors and awards that Jill had won both prior to me uh, taking on the vice president and general manager role of the of the network, but also uh, afterwards. Um, and all of them recognize the fact that Jill is substantially a standout individual. She, she is someone who is influential in her area, but also impactful in what she delivers. And I am so proud to have her content every day on our network, informing our listeners and making them a little smarter in the process. So obviously you're calling the shots. So you kind of hold the key to, uh, well, especially my future. And I guess Jill's if she wants to continue doing the show. So is there another 10 years in the future? I think so. Absolutely. And we've seen it in two different areas, not only, and and, and you know this, and Jill knows this, the, re, the reaction that we get from the audience directly clearly shows that she resonates and has influence. Um, her importance that she plays in a multi-platform way, you, you see it in her social media, you see it in on-demand audio content with her podcast, but also you see it in what she does on CBS television and CBS This Morning. All of that collectively together is a huge brand with Jill on Money, Jill Schlesinger, and CBS News. So it's recognized by both the listener world as well as advertisers that want to be in that space because they see when people talk to Jill, she can inform them and influence them. And that's a powerful thing to have. As I said to Harvey, it's, it's kind of, and you know, obviously, you know this, working in the radio your whole life, it's rare that something in radio lasts 10 years these days. So I guess that says a lot about what she's doing with the show. It does. I think it also says a lot about Jill. And it says a lot about her passion for the medium and the uniqueness that radio is. Radio is an effective tool. It's in many ways the original social media. It's a way for you to reach out to so many people so broadly, uh, which you cannot do in the same way. Social media is much more targeted in what it does. It doesn't surprise me that there is this want to be involved in this ecosystem with Jill. And decisions we make around our finances are something that's a, a story that does not end or change. It's extremely viable in the decisions we make for both our personal lives and our professional lives. And it's something that holds true regardless of time. All right. Well, that's fantastic. Thanks so much to Mark for putting those two interviews in the can for us. Now, when we return to Jill on Money, we're going back to you. We had enough of our little self-examination in our party. Show number 500, your questions will be answered. It is Jill on Money. We'll be right back. Follow Jill on Twitter and Instagram for more personal finance content. Just use the handle at Jill on Money. Now, back to the show. You're back. It's Jill on Money, and it is our 500th show. And to commemorate that, we're going right back to our roots. Let's go to the calls to you for your financial questions. Next up, we've got Ben from Connecticut. Hello, Ben. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Fantastic. Okay, Ben, tell me what's going on, how I can help you out. So right now, we're my wife and I, we're, we're both 36 years old. We're trying to figure out, are we saving enough? Are we saving too much for retirement? I know it's kind of funny to think they're saving too much, but we want to also be able to enjoy life now as well as in the future. And so, so right now, we 
kind of the financial picture we're looking at right now is we're maxing out both of our Roth IRAs. We're both contributing to our employer 401ks just enough to maximize the matching contribution we get mm-hmm. back. Okay. So is that about somewhere four or five, six percent? Is that what you're each doing? Yeah. So uh, my wife's doing four percent. I'm doing five percent. How much do you guys each make? I make uh, just around 95000 a year. She makes about 45000 a year. You're putting a lot of money away, which leads me to think that maybe you don't have children. Is that correct? That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any plans to have children? No. That's why you're going to live large. All right. Keep going. So, you've, you, so you're putting money away, which is yep. great. So both maxing out the Roths, 401ks, 4 or 5% or so, which is great. What else are you doing? And we also have, um, we have an HSA account, so we're maxing out that contribution as well. We have enough to cover the, the annual deductible in the event something happens. Mm. Everything else is going into an investment account within the HSA. All right. That's fantastic. Tell me anything else that I should know. Mortgage, house? Oh, yeah. So we have, we have a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. We've got about 20 years left on that. That is uh, at a rate of three and a quarter percent. So there's a balance of about 165000 left on that. No other debt besides the mortgage, Ben? Correct. How are you feeling with this rate of savings? In other words, do you feel like you are uh, precluded from enjoying yourself in the, you know, in the near term? Is, I mean, do you feel good or do you feel tight? We feel okay. We're comfortable with it. But we just, you know, our, our thing is, okay, are we doing enough? Should we be doing more? Or, you know, there, there are definitely some things that we would, we would like to do, but you know we're we're very budget conscious mm-hmm. as well. So we we have everything categorized. <laughs> mm. Love that about you, poster children for p- financial planning. Have you ever looked at your own retirement projections? I know that it's you know essentially thirty years in the future, but you know w- something that would incorporate future social security or are you entitled to any pension benefits? Either of you. Um, I actually, through my current employer, we have a, a pension benefit as well. So, I would encourage you to, to, I mean, it sounds to me, I haven't run the numbers. I'm just doing this, you know, off the top of my head. It sounds like you're doing a great job, frankly. You really are. Because if you kind of look at your, your totals, you're putting a ton of money away. The HSA really does help protect you, certainly in the longer term around some healthcare issues. Um, you have a pension. There'll be some social security. So it sounds like you're saving at a very good clip. You know, look, I don't think you should be paying down your mortgage any faster. I think that, you know, if you were to run your retirement calculations and it, you project it out and it, you saw, hey, you know what, we're, we're good. We can retire when we're 65 years old. That's great. Then you might want to play a little bit with, you know, if we have way more money than we need, what would happen if we retired a little bit sooner? Or what would happen if we put a little bit less money away? And you can start to see how those numbers really impact your future. I guess that the other aspect of this is you're sort of a self-proclaimed a little bit nutty about your cash flow. Once you run these numbers, you might chill out a little bit about it. And I think that that will be freedom for you. It doesn't mean you're going to do anything different. But I do think that it kind of gives you this opportunity to say, all right, you know, things post-pandemic, we might be able to say instead of feeling guilty about a vacation fund, we feel great about it. Like we're, we've Pack that into the budget. It looks great. So if you run those numbers, I think you'll be far happier and maybe more willing to be a li- cut a little bit loose from that cash flow. You know, it's it's hard. I get it. But I think you've got to give yourself permission. You're working really hard. You got to enjoy it. All right. Perfect. One last thing. Is there sure. anything that would, is there like a rule of thumb to say, okay, how much money should I expect to have on an annual basis when I retire? Like, so- How do I determine what that target is? It's almost working backwards. You know how much money you spend now, right? Right. And so you can look at that. I'm going to just make it up. Let's say that you look at your cash flow. You've already done the hard work. So you examine your cash flow and you say, you know what? Forgetting about the saving for retirement, what we really spend money on, that is about five grand a month. Okay. And then what you're going to do when you look at the retirement calculations is you're going to put that into your future need. It's going to say, how much do you think you need when you're retiring? You're going to say five grand a month, maybe make it six grand a month because you want to like have a lot of fun. 
And then you you have the calculator determine whether the amount of money that you are saving and the accumulation of the funds you've already saved is sufficient to generate the money you need. The calculator will look ahead. It'll say, do you have a pension? You'll say, yes, here's the pension amount. You, you'll have social security. That will be the amount. And then there'll be an amount of money that you need, the gap between what you need and what's coming in. And then the question is, does all the money you save generate that amount of money? So, you know, let's say you needed 30 grand a year extra, okay? Yep. Beyond what's coming in. Well, then you might say to yourself, ah, great. As long as I have a million bucks saved, then that will be 30 grand a year. It's about right. If you had a million dollars in your Roth, you'd say that million could generate 30 grand a year. If you have a million dollars in a pre-tax 401k, you'll have some money in there, not as much, right? right. Um, then you would say that it would be 30 to 35,000, but that would come in and be taxable to you. So you'd kind of have to lop off about a quarter to a third of that. So the combination of the two will help you determine how much you need to save. And the reality is, I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised when you run the numbers because it does not sound like you spend a ton of money. It sounds like you save a ton of money. So I think that will be quite helpful for you. And as I said, it is really important for you to let yourself look at that cash flow and say, all right, you know, here are the things we want to do. Run it, run it as a want before a need. And then you can always fiddle with the numbers after. Okay. That makes sense. Ben from Connecticut, go forth, multiply, and run your retirement numbers, okay? Perfect. Thank you. You're listening to Jill on Money. During the break, why don't you do me a favor? Go onto the website, jillonmoney.com. Right there, jillonmoney.com. And check out all the great stuff that Mark puts on that website, jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. If you've missed any part of the show or want to check out a past show, go to JillOnMoney.com for more great personal finance content. You're back. It's Jill on Money. This is the program that takes the mystery out of your financial life. I am Jill Schlesinger. I am joined by Mark Talercio, who has now abandoned the microphone. So uh, if you missed any part of the show, you really should take a listen. You can go to the website, jillonmoney.com, or you can go to YouTube and check it out later because Mark's on the microphone. It is our 500th radio show. I cannot believe it. More than a decade's worth of work. And here it is, the culmination of that. So we uh, did some great interviews earlier in the show with our two former bosses, the folks who put us on the air to begin with. And uh, so Mark was kind enough to interview um, both Harvey Nagler and Craig Swagler of CBS Radio. And uh, they were very nice and said nice things about me. So I'll take it. Uh, anyway, now back to you and your questions, because that's what this show is about, answering your financial questions. If you've got something going on in your financial life, please send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. This is a note from Angela whose subject line is, what now? <laughs> I like that. Okay, she writes, Jill, I'm 65, in very good physical shape, but with virtually no savings. Mm. I burned through my savings this year due to clients shuttering projects amid COVID-19. Oh, I've heard a lot about these stories. This is tough. And she goes on to write, I admit I made lots of bad decisions. I own my mistakes, and this is my reality. I accept that I'm going to have to work part-time or more for the rest of my life. I had planned to file for Social Security in my 70s. I wonder if I should do so now while continuing to look for work. I am a technical writer. I get that doing so will cut into my monthly payments, but I wonder if it would be better to have some financial certainty than none at all. <sighs> Well, all right, uh, Angela, I need to know a little bit more about you, meaning that I, I don't know how much money you have. If you have absolutely zero money and no savings and no other sources of income, then yeah, you're going to have to file for Social Security. If you have some money, you have a retirement account, is there anything else there? Is there some home equity? I don't know, but it sounds to me like you're if you're living on the edge, I think you're going to have to file. 
unfortunately. I'm sorry, um, but it is better to have something than nothing. And I certainly wouldn't want to see you uh, start piling on debt. Okay. But if I'm missing something or there is other, uh, there's something else that's out there, do let me know. Lori writes, love the pod. Podcast called Jill on Money. You can get it too. Okay. Lori goes on. I have a question that puzzles most people. So it's your turn. Here we go. If I die with debt, whose problem is it? Won't be mine. <laughs> I'm single, no children. I don't own a home. I rent. I have only modest possessions. My various financial accounts all have named beneficiaries. As a hypothetical, okay, let's say I die with $20,000 in credit card debt. Whose problem is it? Could a bank come after my retirement account, even though there's a named beneficiary? Would my executor need to have a yard sale to pay the bill? Anytime I ask someone this question, they brush it off as a joke. I'm trying to be thoughtful about the problems I might leave behind for other people. Can you explain what happens in this circumstance? Okay, here's what happens. When you die, you go through the probate process. And the probate process is essentially a, a sort of a judicial proceeding that basically alerts any creditors out there that you've died. And then they do have a chance to go after the estate for the money. However, if all of your money is in retirement accounts, it's a lot harder to get to that money. It's not so much that you have named beneficiaries, but retirement accounts like a 401k or a 403b or a 457 plan, that is actually protected against litigation. So that said, if it's that kind of an account, you wouldn't have to worry. But if there's money in a checking account, even if it's a transfer on death account, then they could come after you. Most times they don't come after you. When someone dies, they usually just write it off. So, uh, I mean, I don't suggest that this should be the way that you um, proceed in managing your financial life. It would seem to me that, you know, better not to have debt than having debt. But, uh, you know, unless it happens to be student loan debt where they really do come after everybody else for your money, um, in some states, it's pretty awful, by the way, uh, then you probably don't have to worry too much. Okay. Dave writes, I heard you on the Stacking Benjamin show. I am recently retired. Do you think it's better to reinvest dividends and interest as we do during the accumulation phase? Or do I put it, have the money flow into a cash bucket for spending? Thanks, Dave. Dave, it depends on what's going on. Do you need the money? I mean, if you know you're going to use that money, you need the cash, then I think it's quite sort of a, a normal way of proceeding to say, let that flow into the cash account. That's the cash from which you'll tap. But if you don't need that money, if you got cash elsewhere, then you could reinvest it. But a lot of people do that in retirement so that they start funding their annual spending needs from that account. So it kind of depends what else you have. Uh, it doesn't necessarily, there's not like a right or wrong answer, but it, it can generally be an easy way to kind of keep track of how much money you need to set aside for your spending every year. Okay. That's a good question. 500th show, Mark, I'm out of breath. Uh, if you've got a financial question, just give us a shout. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. Or if you're on the website, jillonmoney.com, we've got a little contact button. It's in the upper right-hand corner. Very easy. Just click on it and send us your question. It's Jill on Money. It's the 500th episode. Oh, my God. I cannot believe it. doesn't feel like that, Nenny. And uh, Mark and I know that we are only here because of you. So please take the time to send us your questions. We'd be happy to answer them. And we're getting more and more of you back on the air. We want to hear your voices. Jill on Money. We'll be right back. You're back. It's Jill on Money, the 500th episode. I cannot even believe. So awesome. We are broadcasting from the Capital One Bank Virtual Studios. Capital One, this is Banking Reimagined. What's in your wallet? Let's uh, take a question from John before we go to the break. And it's about Social Security. John says, I am over 70, but not 70 and a half and working full time. My wife is retired and she takes Social Security. Plus, I'm taking advantage of the spousal benefit, 50% of her monthly payment 
So I've not yet started taking my social security. When I do start taking my social security, they will exceed the spousal benefits monthly payments I'm now receiving. Good. Okay. I wanted to wait to start taking social security until I'm eligible for the maximum. So I am, am I there? My plan is to continue to work full time for the foreseeable future. Is it time for me to drop that spousal benefit and start taking my payments? I assume I'm not entitled to both. Correct. Yeah. Sorry. Can't get no double dipping. Um, you are there, my friend. It's age 70. So that's it. That's when you have to get the maximum and you are there. Is there a tax consequence or any other negative by continuing to work full time? Nope. And you can take your social security. So no penalty, no problem. Keep taking it. And for those of you listening, again, we've always talked about this, which is if you can wait, and most people don't actually have this as a choice, if you can wait, it's so helpful because you get this guarantee of about 8% more every single year. It's just, that's how the social security program works. So if you can wait, fantastic. If you can't, I get it, but at least try to wait till your full retirement age. And uh, maybe if you could, you work a little longer. That's one of the best ways to hit your retirement goals. Not so many things we can control. Um, some of the working longer um, advice I give does not always apply. So, you know, obviously saving, working longer, controlling your expenses. That's what you can do. All right. That is it for hour number one of show number 500. When we return, we're going to take more of your questions. It is Jill on Money. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com is our email address. We'll be right back. It's the weekend, and that can only mean one thing. You're listening to Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. You're back. It's our number two of the 500th episode of the Jill on Money show. I can't believe that I'm saying that. 500 markets just blows my mind. This is the show that tries to help you navigate your financial life and this hour, we are broadcasting from the Policy Genius Virtual Studios. Policy Genius is the easy way to compare and buy insurance. They also have a pretty neat tool. You can do some online estate planning as well. Just go to policygenius.com. Well, in honor of our 500th show, Mark was running through all of our records and he says, oh my gosh, we never aired an interview that we had conducted way back when with Erin Lowry. Now, you may have even seen Erin. She's a really all over the place. She's an author of Broke Millennial and a couple of other books. And, you know, I thought it was really kind of neat for the 500th show that we could resurrect this interview that we had conducted. I think it must have been a few years ago. I don't know what happened, Mark. How did we lose track of this? She's really terrific and very nice breath of fresh air of someone who's very interested in trying to help millennials manage their money. So obviously, this is all pre-pandemic. This is before Aaron got married and wrote another book. But going back in time, Aaron Lowry, the broke millennial, and we start the interview with a, a recounting of her background, which is kind of wild. So here's our interview with Erin Lowry. You're like um, the millennial whisperer for us. <laughs> You're going to tell us why millennials need this book and why every single one listening to this should buy a slew of these books and give them to all the kids who are graduating. So first of all, welcome to the show. Hi, Erin. Hi, thanks for having me. What's your deal? Like, where are you from? Like, I, I'm not, I know nothing about you, really. I mean, I know what I can read, glean, but What's the real scoop here? Where I'm from is one of the hardest questions you could actually lead off with. Okay. I was an expat kid, so I grew up moving around quite a bit. So born in Texas, then Nevada, then North Carolina, then Japan, then China. Then I repatriated to America for college. After college, I moved to New York City, and I've been here ever since. Hold on. Let's go back for a second. <laughs> 
Japan and China. Yes. Uh, so what? how old were you in Japan? I was 10 to 16 in Japan and then 16 to 18 in China. What did your parents do that you were moving around so much? My dad works in the lithium industry. As so. in the battery lithium? Yes, as in the raw material that goes into the really? batteries. Really? And so in Japan, where'd you live? I lived in Kobe, Japan, and then Shanghai, China. First of all, I love Shanghai. Yes. Love that city. So do you speak any of these languages? Skoshidake and Idi and Dien. So Just a, a little bit. bit a little <laughs> bit of both. Uh, was it hard to be 10 to 16 years old in Japan? I loved it. You did? I think part of it is kids are so adaptable. Mm. So... I threw major ta temper tantrums moving there, and then I have diaries from that time of my life. So it's amazing to see day one, it's like, I can't believe they did this to me. <laughs> I'm so upset. And then two weeks later, I'm like, oh, my God, it's so great here. I love it here. And did you go to an American school? International school. International yeah. school. And so English was spoken? Yes, primary language. In the classrooms, outside of the classrooms, it was a glorious hodgepodge of languages. So what's going on in Kobe? Like, I've never been there except for, you know, knowing that they have beef. Yes, it is the most delicious beef. Um, well, actually, my dad worked in Osaka, which was where he was based, but Kobe had the slightly better international school. So we posted up in Kobe for a living, and he had a like hour commute to work on the train each way. Mm. Yeah. How was that, though? I mean, what a homogenous society in Japan. I felt like I stuck out like a sore thumb when I was there. I was like, oh, Amazon girl from New York City. And it was it was like crazy. In fact... I found the trains like a little bit weird where everyone was wearing a black suit with a white pressed shirt. Yes. How was it then for you? For the most part, it's such an odd experience growing up as an expat when you look so different. You know, you can't blend in. But especially the Japanese culture is its such a beautiful culture. It's so respectful. I think it was so safe. I mean, being 10 years old, my sister and I got to walk to school by ourselves. We were taking trains to places with our friends by ourselves. It was really a beautiful way to spend a childhood. And um, did you learn different, like, aspects of that, that that you now, like, do you know how to, for example, hmm, roll your own sushi? Oh, I'm not that skilled. Sushi uh -huh. rolling is a whole That's new a thing. That's a serious deal. There's a, my friends will joke there are certain things that I do that they attribute to my expat childhood. Some is not understanding cultural references that oh. they grew up with. So I had a, the English television that I had was really airing like Family Ties, Baywatch, <laughs> shows that if I were 10 years older, that would have been my reference point. So people that are on their really late 30s, I have a better pop cultural reference with them than my own peers. No and, Gilmore Girls for you. Well, Gilmore Girls, once I moved to China, we could get pirated DVDs. Oh. That's when I started getting tuned into what the American kids were watching. All right. So Shanghai, uh, also a beautiful city, a real, um, you know, sort of old China, new China aspect to it. Uh, how'd you, how was that? I mean, first of all, just having tea in Shanghai is like one of the most quintessentially fabulous experiences of my life. It was a beautiful, beautiful experience. And what there. year did you go? Uh, I went to China in 2011. So that is right when I was graduating high school, actually. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to me how much it changed, not only in the years that my family lived there, because I came back for college, but my parents and my little sister still lived in China. So we would be I would go back on breaks to China. And it has become so westernized mm. so fast. Mm. And it's still certainly retaining some of its original identity. But as wealth has come into the country, it's been fascinating to see what has happened. And just in the two years that I was there in high school, junior and senior years of high school, so much shifted, even down to Starbucks being everywhere all of a sudden. That yeah. wasn't there when I moved there. Yeah, I don't remember Starbucks being in Shanghai. Although what I do remember is the incredible amount, especially in... Um, when we went to Beijing, of high-end stores yes. in malls. I, I was It was so striking, like, oh, we need another Louis Vuitton here? I guess so, because everybody's... And, and you know, they really... they Their service model is hysterical, because they really... It's not a service culture. It didn't begin as one. So you walk into a store, and they are, like, all over you. They don't know, like, a light touch. They're like, do you want to buy something? And you're like, oh, back off. Back off. We're not ready, right? You know, it was, yep. it was fascinating. And and so uh, where'd you go to college? I went to a school called St. Bonaventure University. St. Bonnie's upstate yeah. in New York, Way Vermont upstate. or something. Where the heck is it? Near-ish. 
I couch it with Ish because it's about an hour and a half away from Buffalo, but that is really our closest major city. Wow. <laughs> yes. Our friends of WBEN listening are going to be very happy to hear that. Why would you pick that school of all? I mean, I cannot think of a more radical difference than being in Shanghai than being an hour and a half outside of Buffalo. Money. Money. Oh, they gave you money? Gave me lots of money. Oh, my God. I love that. Okay. So we're going to get into this uh, because now we're going to start getting into your whole money profile and why this is important to us. Do you? Ha, by the way, how about your chopstick usage? Pretty oh, good. excellent. You're amazing? Yes. And tea brewing? Fantastic. Yes. And I prefer tea to coffee, although right now I've been drinking a lot of coffee to stay awake. But you know, I am it's more the book a tour. Person. It's the book tour, girl. Get on it. <laughs> Come on. You're gonna. It's it's brutal. But this is going to be a fun one. I yeah. promise. Did you did did all of your other interviews start off with a lengthy discussion no. of your expat childhood? Very few people know that, really. Okay, we'll get back to our interview with Aaron Lowry in just a minute. Hey, during the break, hop onto the website JillOnMoney.com and check out all the neat stuff that we've been writing got a big article on how to start attacking the FAFSA form because, hey, it's that time of year, ladies and gentlemen. JillOnMoney.com. Just click on the Read tab and you can check it out. All right. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger takes the mystery out of your finances. You're back. It's Jill on Money. This is the program that tries to navigate all the choppy seas or helps you scale all the hurdles in your financial life, whatever metaphor you want. We are here for you. If you've got a financial question, give us a shout. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. So we're airing an interview that we had conducted some time ago with Erin Lowry. She's the author of Broke Millennial. She also has another book. It's called Broke Millennial Takes on Investing. In fact, I think I was a, I was a source in that book. I think I'm quoted in that book quite a bit. Anyway, uh, in this segment, we're talking about student loans. And what a time to be doing that because... Right now is the time where people are starting the financial aid process, the new FAFSA form as of October 1st available. And don't forget, a lot of financial aid, it is first come, first serve. And many of you are going to have to have amended forms and you're going to have to submit different information to get a professional judgment from college and financial aid officers. Everything is there for you. It's at JillOnMoney.com under the Read tab. FAFSA, it's open season on financial aid, and you really got to get to this. Okay. Now, that said, we're going to talk about student loans in this part of the interview with Aaron Lowry. Stay tuned. On the other side, I'll tell you more about Aaron. Your book is dedicated to your dad, to your mom. Kaylin must be the sister. Mm -hmm. Who's Peach, the dog? Peach is my boyfriend. No. Yeah. Peach, he wants to know, Mark, the producer, wants to know what, what's up with Peach. So, Peach, I'm actually not going to say his real name because I'm kind of respecting his privacy a little bit. Oh, Peach. come on. <laughs> Can he help us sell this book or not? Peach uh, was the moniker I created for him when I started talking about our relationship a little bit online, and he didn't want me to share his specific numbers. Uh, we can get into it later, but he has student loan debt. I do not. So it's been a big talking point for me when writing about money. And Peach is actually what I do call him in real life. It is connected to his real life name. Hmm. Okay. We'll get into that. I'm very... All right. So your your dad worked in the lithium business. Uh, did your mom work or was she busy taking care of you guys and living the expat life where like they smoke cigarettes and go out for tea? She was big into volunteering. I would say more of the philanthropy part of being an expat. She was a teacher before I was born. Um, once we moved overseas, though, it was a little bit difficult for her to be able to work because of right. regulations and everything. And then now back in the States, she's kind of bounced around between she's been an adjunct professor and then she also is a real estate agent oh yes. excellent my mother is uh, i i think i can now call my mother a retired real estate agent okay so here's my question for you what was it like i mean as you grew up in this weird expat life what was your own relationship to money that's a great question because it's such a bizarre world 
And my dad had a great line that he told me recently. And to back it up, my parents talked to me about money from a very, very young age. So around seven years old, I was getting my first financial lessons. And same with my little sister. So money had always been a very open topic in our household. And once we moved overseas, my dad's new goal was to make sure that we were enabled, not entitled, is how he describes it, because we were surrounded by a lot of wealth. Hmm. And he wanted to make sure that we understood that this wasn't necessarily normal. It was normal to us, certainly, but this isn't how the rest of the world lived. Mm -hmm. And that everybody in your class's parents were not going to be in double comma land, as I call it. And that that, you know, going back to the States, things weren't going to be quite that way. Interesting. Now, so did you know, for example, did you know how much your father made? You know, that was the one question that I never really got out of him when I was younger. Mm-hmm. Now I do. Mm-hmm. I, I know about his net worth now. It's a very open conversation between us. But I remember being 18 years old and applying to college, or I right. guess I was 17. And when you fill out those FAFSA forms, and a lot of colleges ask like where your parents are on the scale of income, mm-hmm. and I went up to him and was like, well, what's the answer? And he said, I'm not telling you that. Interesting. And I said, what? Because money had been so open, I was blown away. And it was really, and I kind of backed him up on it. I was like, why? And he goes, that's not their business. So he was bothered that the schools wanted to know. And then he kind of said, you're not going to be eligible for any of the work-study programs. It doesn't matter. Uh huh. Um, but I still had to pay for 50% of my college education. Okay, wait. So I want to get into that. Uh, so because you said you went to St. Bonaventure because they offered you money. Yes. And so your parents, who probably could have written the check themselves for the whole thing, it was important for them to say, you're on the hook for half, right? Yes. Did you know that from an early age, from like in the beginning of high school? Did you know that? I knew that when I was applying to colleges, I thought I was going to be calling their bluff. Really? Yes. So I made a Big fatal error. Wow. Yeah. And so how did that play out? To explain. Not well. <laughs> no. tell, so tell me what happened. So there were two parts of this process that were rough. One was the deal was you had to pay for you being me and then my little sister. You had to pay for 50%. Lucky your little um, sister. She gets to come after you to see the yes, mistakes you made. She does. Mm-hmm. Um, it's important to know my dad was very self-made. It was important to him that we understood the value of money. And he felt that we wouldn't necessarily value college the same way if we weren't on the hook for it a little bit. hmm And in addition, the other rule was you had to apply to every college scholarship for which you were eligible. And if they found one that I didn't apply for and I was eligible, I would be on the hook for that sum of money. Whoa. Yeah. How did you do that? How did you scour the earth and look for those scholarships? Online. Just did it. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it it was pretty easy. I think counselors helped a little bit, college counselors in high school. But at that point, it was 2006, 2007, and there was a lot online. And um, my mom actually did find one full ride to Wake Forest in North Carolina that I had not applied for. It was a theater scholarship. Why? You're theatrical? I was going to be a theater major. What? Yeah theater and journalism. And she came into my room late one night, two days before the deadline and said, hey, you apply for this? And I said, nope. And you did. And she goes, well, you better. It's a full ride scholarship. Otherwise, we're not paying. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. So I applied. I had two days to memorize two monologues, write a couple of essays, get that sent off, did it all and actually got a call in to come and fly back to America to audition for that scholarship. What'd you audition with? I auditioned with Merchant of Venice. I was wow. Yeah. Oh, my God. And then God. I also had a directing portfolio from high school that I brought in. No musical theater, which I can tap into here. Mm, straight up theater. Straight up okay. drama. All right. All right. Okay. So now you got skin in the game. Mm-hmm. And do you think that that is something that made you much more financially aware than perhaps your cohorts who are going to college? Absolutely. And it may, I had to make a rational decision at a very young age. I did not get that scholarship to wake. And the decision came down. I'd actually sent in my seat deposit. And then my dad talked to me about, hey, that's $52,000 a year. You owe 50%. You're going to come out looking at eighty dollars to $100,000 easy. And I think they were going to help subsidize freshman year a little bit. Yeah. And um, he goes, St. Bonaventure offered you academic scholarship money. Free ride. Yeah. It was, they were going to pay a little over 50%, but that covered my portion. So it would be me coming out debt free. Aha. Uh-huh. Now, so I guess what I'm wondering is this. A lot of times when I have conversations with folks who call into the show or listen, you know, write us, uh, they'll say, I'll 
I try to explain that, you know, you're going to graduate in debt and my kid doesn't get it. Did you find that? Do you find that among people that that people don't get it? Or do you think that the parents are just wimping out and not having the tough conversations? I think a lot of times people don't get it. It's hard to think about what that burden actually means for you, especially if you haven't been thinking about and using money and budgeting money at that point in your life. And especially because money to millennials and Gen Z is very digital. It's almost monopoly money to us at this point. And what ends up happening is, and I've seen this play out with a lot of my friends, you graduate with... 30, 50, 60, $100,000 in student loan debt, and then you start thinking, eh, what's five more? What's 10 more? At this point, I'm so deep in the hole, what does it matter? We'll get back to our interview with Erin Lowry in just a minute. I just want to say that she is uh, one of the more thoughtful, younger people who has actually started researching about money and money issues. And she's got some very interesting stuff on her own website, brokemillennial.com, so you should check that out. When we return, more of our interview with Erin Lowry. Follow Jill on Twitter and Instagram for more personal finance content. Just use the handle at Jill on Money. Now, back to the show. You're back. It's Jill on Money. And this is the program that tries to help you become a better parent, aunt, uncle, friend, advisor, colleague to millennials also. Yeah, I know. It's part of your life. We're in the midst of our interview with Erin Lowry. She's the author of Broke Millennial. And in this portion of our interview, I thought it was important for us to go back, take a step back essentially and say, so many of you guys who are listening, and certainly for me as well, that in our lives, we are talking to people about money in ways that maybe our parents talk to us about money. That may not be the smartest way to tackle the issue. I know this firsthand because there are times where I have spoken to nieces and nephews and they are millennials. And uh, I think that some of the messaging that we got, it doesn't translate as well. It just doesn't. So in this part of our interview with Erin Lowry, the author of Broke Millennial, one of the things that I wanted to know from her is how can we of the older generation talk to millennials in a way that they will receive the messages that we are trying to give them? Because isn't that really the the whole point here? We don't need to wag our fingers. We do need to explain and hopefully be heard. So here is more of our interview with Aaron Lowry. How can parents, grandparents, friends have conversations with their kids to break through this idea that a millennial, as you said, you know, doesn't really deal in a cash society. It's a digital currency. It's so many things that, you know, with a click of a button as opposed to taking $100 out of your your pocket or your backpack. How do you break through and have the conversation that's meaningful to help foster smarter financial decisions for your kids? There are a few different options. I would say if you're already at the point where your kid is going to college or in college, I would look first at what realistically their salary is going to be after they graduate. So, for example, I was a journalism and theater major. It was really hard to figure out what my salary was going to be. but It wasn't going to be a lot. Yeah, that was what we knew. So I think what would have been a good practice for someone who's in my position is say, let's say your starting salary you know is going to be $30,000. Now let's break that down. Some's going to taxes. Let's take 30% out, 70% you have remaining. Let's say you have to pay rent and all of the, you know, factor in all the different things the kid's going to have to pay for down to cell phone bill and internet. And then say, and on top of this, if you are $40,000 in debt and you're owing your servicer $350 a month, where's that money coming from? And breaking it down like that, it really helps click in a kid's head, oh, wow, maybe I can't afford what I think I can. It's interesting, like, as you said, breaking it down, making it real, and comparing it to what it costs to do something today, mm-hmm. right? 
So do, are you one of the people who is in fa- a fan of the allowance for a kid? I have mixed feelings about the allowance. I think it's hard to pass judgment on how a parent wants to have their child earn money. I would rather it always be getting earned some way, however you want that to be, if it's chores. But by the time a kid can actually get a job, I would rather the child have a real job than the parents handing money over because that still is creating kind of this... I call it parental welfare state, if you will. It seems like that there's a lot of parental welfare state. I mean, I shouldn't say that because it's not everyone, but I, I am always struck by those surveys that in the post-recession years, the number of parents who are still supporting their adult children, it's kind of mind-blowing. So let me go back to your story for a second. So you graduate from college, and what was your first job? I worked as a page for The Late Show with David Letterman. Really? Yes. That's kind of fun. And yeah. what year was that? That was in 2011. Okay. And so you were in college during the financial crisis. Yes. Was it scary for people there? I don't remember anyone really talking about it, to be Isn't honest. Isn't that amazing? Which is Bliss. mind-blowing. Bliss. Bliss in a place. Well, well, I mean, you're in a private school, right? Yep. And uh, it, it's pretty expensive. I mean, I guess some kids had to drop out because There were of definitely it. kids that dropped out. I don't think we knew why. I think oh, that was really? a big part of it. Interesting. Um, it was a school. Where there were a lot of subsidies for kids who needed it mm-hmm. at my school. That's kind of a big part of the college. And so it was very interesting. There were definitely kids that left, and there never really seemed to be conversations about why that was happening. Tell me how this book gets started. Like, what happens here? There's, a, there, I need the origin story. Sure. So I was a page. Uh, I also was a barista at Starbucks, and I was babysitting. So I was working three jobs to make ends meet. Wait, where did you get insurance? Through Starbucks? Oh, I was, luckily, this is one place that I was getting some nice privilege. I was still on my parents because I was under 26. Oh, right. Yes. Beautiful. Okay. Yes. So for that first year, I was on their insurance. And then I ended up going to work in PR, and that's when I was totally 100% independent. I was paying for everything except insurance that first year. Okay. And then- Where'd you live? I lived in Astoria, Queens, where I still live today. Nice. Yep. All right. So that was the first thing. I picked an outer borough neighborhood so that I could afford it a little bit better. And not some Brooklyn nonsense. No, it was. Although now it's trendy. But I I will say when I moved there, it was not. Right. And then, um, so my first year post-college, so this is, I'm in the real, real world now. I have a real job. Right. I was talking to a friend of mine, and she had moved to New York to be an actress. Classic story. And she comes from a background where her family has very comfortable means. She didn't have student loan debt. She was not married. She had no kids. She had no credit card debt. Seems like the perfect position to be in if you want to kind of pursue the starving artist's classic lifestyle. And we were talking about it, and she had taken a job working as an assistant to two executives at Viacom. And she really hated it. And she didn't have any time to do anything. And I said to her, I don't understand if you are debt-free... Worst case scenario, you can go back to mom and dad and get a loan. Not that I advocate for that, but worst case scenario, your par- you have that relationship with your parents. Why aren't you nannying, waitressing, doing what you got to do to just kind of hustle but pursue your craft? Mm. And she said to me, money stresses me out. I just hope I have enough at the end of the month. Oh, God. And that was my light bulb moment that, you know, what you grow up around is normal. And so to me, talking about money was normal. And I sort of assumed ignorantly of me that a lot of people felt that way and so then I started crowdsourcing and asking a bunch of other millennials what their feelings were towards money and quickly got shut down and then I was like all right I'm gonna change this and that's how initially the website broke millennial.com started and it's very storytelling format which the book is the same way and I thought this is how I'm gonna tap into people is I'm gonna just tell them a story Okay, we'll get back to our interview with Aaron Lowry in just a minute. Hey, during the break, why don't you subscribe to our sister broadcast? It's called Jill on Money. Yeah, just like this show. You can get it on Apple and Stitcher, Spotify, Radio.com, Google Play, wherever you get your favorite podcast. That is where you can find our sister broadcast, Jill on Money. So check it out. Okay, we'll be right back. If you've missed any part of the show or want to check out a past show, go to JillOnMoney.com for more great personal finance content. You're back. It's Jill on Money. 
And we are uh, airing an interview that we had conducted way back when with Aaron Lowry, the author of Broke Millennial. And uh, in this part of our interview, we start tackling that issue of money and relationships. I have to say that Erin has a very interesting take on this. At this point, when she was, when we had interviewed her, she was engaged, I believe. I'm not sure. Was that, am I right, Mark? Where was she just dating? I think she was engaged. She was engaged and she's now married. I don't know what had happened. We kind of lost track of this interview. So I'm glad we're re-airing it here for the 500th show at the Jill on Money program. All right, here is the final part of our interview with Aaron Lowry. You talk about understanding your money mindset and you actually bring up Tinder. Can you please explain? Chapter two is called, Is Money a Tinder Date or Marriage Material? And what I mean by that is, do you have a hit it and quit it mentality around your money, which would be akin to the Tinder date? Mm -hmm. Or is money something that you're trying to create this lasting, lifelong relationship with? And, you know, certainly there are more groups that people can fall into, but I do consider those to be the two biggies. And money is not a rational thing. And we so often get advice that's based purely on what's rational. Mm. And that's not how we interact with money. We are very emotional, very irrational when it comes to our money. And I don't think you can start a book or start a conversation about how to better your financial life without saying, hey, what are your psychological hangups when it comes to money? And that's what I try to get people to identify right off the bat. And I think that's helpful when you go into the chapter about um, getting financially naked with your partner, because I think that if you don't know yourself, it's hard to articulate that. And then you have all these horrible stories about people kind of having that difficulty and having that conversation. So you and Peach or Peaches? Peach. You and <laughs> I was going to say Peaches, which is funny. Mark's now making. So you and Peach, the boy. Yes. Um you got financially naked pretty quick? I wouldn't say quick. We've been together about seven years at this point. Seven years? Jeez. Yeah. Oh, yep. We were college sweethearts. Oh. And I would Mark say... Mark wants you to get married. <laughs> we'll get there. We're working out the money part first. Okay. Okay. That's fair enough. <laughs> yep. So, well, I would say it was maybe three years in is when we first had this conversation. And the way I like to say is once you realize you could marry that person, that's when I want you to be having the conversation. How did you start the conversation? I said, hey, how much student loan debt do you have? Stop it. It was not the most tactful way to start this conversation. Did you? And you outed him online, but not with his real name, but just the amount. Or his real numbers. No. Oh, we, okay. I, I, I was going to ask that. I will give approximates. Um, he has requested I do not share his exact numbers. It's his private life. I can't share everything. Okay. Understood. Uh, but Not that that would stop us. but It is a significant <laughs> sum, in my opinion, especially because he is a teacher. Oh. Yes. Okay, but a pension. Hello. Yes, I love you a do have a pension. But it was something that I was having that conversation with him. This was when he was in getting his master's degree. And he came out of his master's debt-free. All of his debt is from undergrad. Ugh. Yes. And it was a situation where I wanted to kind of know what we as a couple would be on the hook for if we were to get married. Because I have a very team mentality about money. So you would be the kind of person, like, we get this question constantly. Remember we got this, like, about the 27-year-old dude? And he's like, should I co-sign for a loan with my fiance to pay. We don't like co-signing, but you're of the opinion. And again, this is obviously based on whoever you are, that you would both be paying off the loan because we get a lot of people who are like, I'm not paying off his, her loan. Once we're married. Once we're married. Yes. I will not put a penny towards <laughs> it. I love this Until moment. we are legally combined. Okay. Because if you think about it, as soon as we are on paper legally intertwined, that debt is impacting my financial life, too. Right. So the faster we can get rid of it, the better. And I out earn him. I'm the breadwinner in the relationship. And if I can help get that debt to go away, then why wouldn't I do that? Now, we had a, many iterations of this conversation. And what we ended up deciding on as a couple is that my salary, he felt very strongly that it was his debt. And I felt very strongly it would be our debt. Mm -hmm. And it took a lot of compromise. And I said, well, how about... My salary would pay for the day-to-day -day lifestyle expenses. Your salary, you put some money into your pension, some money into an emergency fund, maybe a little savings goal otherwise that we have, but the rest of it goes towards your debt. So you are technically paying for it, but I only know. because I am supporting yes, the rest of, of our life. Yes, of course. It's like kabuki, but it's fabulous, <laughs> yes. right? And you, you see, you got that. Um, 
I, I, I guess that, that that's a conversation that older people also have a hard time having. I My advice always is do not start to have your money conversation in the middle of a blistering fight. No. We just don't want to do that. And I do think that, like, your idea about being inward first to identify your own stuff, your own baggage around this is really important. Because if you don't know yourself, how are you going to be in this process? Yeah. And getting financially naked is more about just saying, you have debt, I don't have debt, or we both have debt. It's also identifying things like, are you a spender or a saver? What are your long-term, short-term, medium-term financial goals? Are we on the same page about these things? And I also say, if you were to get physically naked in front of another human being and that human being laughed at you, you are never going to do it again. Yes. In so, fact, we are all naked right here. I just <laughs> want to let you know, me, Mark, Aaron, we're all naked. It's unbelievable. And we have so such true. great respect for each other. So true. It's but working. it's the same with your money. If you're going to get financially naked with your partner, do not laugh. Do not make snide remarks. Mm. Have a good poker face going into this conversation. Well, thanks so much to Aaron Lowry. We owe her an apology. I think we made it to the podcast with her. We just never got her on the radio show. So very happy that we were able to do this. And when we return, we'll do one last email from you guys. Again, 500th show. Can't thank you enough. You guys are the reason that we are here. So Jill on Money, we'll be right back. You're back. It's Jill on Money. And before we conclude our 500th show, 500, baby, that's a lot. That's a real number. I want to remind you that we are broadcasting from the Policy Genius Virtual Studios. Policy Genius, it's the easy way to compare and buy insurance. We also have some estate planning stuff now. So you can check that out. Go to policygenius.com. So we got a, a question from a listener named Paul, who was uh, listening to the program and said that uh, I was talking to somebody in his early 60s and he wanted to know whether to withdraw money from his 401k before his required minimum distributions and before Social Security. And I told him it was a bad idea. And he said, um, this confused me because I would think for most people, it would be a good idea because you could get money out of the 401k at a low tax rate while your income is low. Once you need to start taking RMDs at 72, your income will be higher and your tax rate also could be higher. Can you comment on how you reach your conclusion? In general, what we try to do is keep the money in the retirement account and defer your taxation. But you're right. If you're in a lower tax bracket, it could make sense. So, Paul, that's an awesome uh, catch on your part. In general, gang, what you want to try to do is get money out of retirement accounts at the lowest possible tax bracket. It is true that once you turn 72 and you're required to start taking money out, your tax bracket might pop, but it may not. Good catch, Paul, and thanks so much for writing. All right, that's it. That is the 500th show. I cannot believe it. Please, please check out all of our resources at the jillonmoney.com website. And if you've got a financial question for the 501st show, send us an email, ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. Don't forget, don't let your guard down. Wash your hands, wear your masks, maintain your physical distancing, do something nice for someone else today. And we want to thank Joel Goodman. He's composed our music. And I never, ever, ever could do anything without my partner in crime, Mark Talercio, the best executive producer in the world. Thanks for everything. Thanks for listening. You guys made us get to this place. Thanks for the 500th show. All right. We'll talk to you next week. <laughs>